My name is Helen Sullivan, and as Dean of the ANU's College of Asia and the Pacific, I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening for the commencement of the ANU 2024 China in the World Forum. Uh, before we begin, I would like to uh, pay my respects to the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people of the Canberra region and to all First Nations on Australians on whose traditional lands we meet, work, live and, pay, and play. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that this land was never ceded. China's rise as a global power has profound implications for world peace, for regional security, international political economy, technological advancement, climate response, international organization and beyond. The rising power's economic heft and military might, overseas economic footprint and ambition in global governance have inevitably challenged the US-dominated world order. And the increasing rivalry between the United States and China is posing new challenges for Pacific Rim countries, which must navigate the interests and the preferences of both powers while assessing the domestic policy implications of their strategic choices. This year's China in the World Forum has brought together scholars from across the Pacific to explore small states and middle powers' responses to these tensions. Participants in the forum include scholars from Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines, Japan, China, England, Scotland, Chile, and the United States. Papers cover the changing world order, security alliances, political economy, technological stagecraft, and public diplomacy. So something, I think, here for everyone. Uh, now, as many of you will know, Southeast Asia is a key theater of US-China competition. And we are very, very delighted to be able to welcome Professor ching Chi Quick from the National University of Malaysia, who is a leading scholar of alignment behavior in the region. Professor Quick is a professor of international relations at the Institute of Malaysian and International Studies in the National University of Malaysia. He is concurrently a non-resident senior fellow at Johns Hopkins Foreign Policy Institute and a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie China. His research focuses on the foreign policies of small states and middle powers in the wake of great power competition in the Indo-Pacific. I don't like using the term Indo-Pacific. I much prefer the term Asia-Pacific for reasons that are probably obvious to you given my job title. Um, but I'm prepared to make a concession for scholarship. Uh, tonight, Professor Quick will share with us the nuanced differences and shifts in middle state alignment choices in an increasingly volatile external environment. So please join me in welcoming Professor Quick to the ANU and to China in the World to deliver the keynote address at this year's forum. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Helen Sullivan, for your very kind introduction and also, uh, I would say, thoughtful scene setting uh, remarks. And also, uh, thank you, Paul, uh, for your warm remarks as well as a beautiful song. A very good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, let me begin by thanking um, CIW, particularly uh, Australian, um, CIW, uh, Australian Centre on China in the World, particularly my good friend, Dr. Uh, Director Dr. Ben Hillman, and also his team for having me here. This is not uh, my first trip to uh, ANU, but uh, it is certainly the first time I uh, have the chance to uh, visit and also uh, share my thoughts at uh, CIW. So uh, I feel deeply honored and also uh, humble uh, to uh, share some thoughts uh, in front of so many distinguished scholars, experts, and also policy practitioners and informer audience. And um, I look around the room, I see, I saw many friends and also uh, familiar faces. And uh, I thought that uh, what I'm going to do uh, before I talk about the three points for today, those who are smiling uh, certainly uh, know that in every occasion, whether it's a three minute remarks, one hour remarks, or a three hours remarks, I always have three points. <laughs> So the three points that I have for today are about blind spots, bright spots, and blinking spots. I saw uh, there are already uh, some blinking eyes. I would uh, kind of elaborate uh, whether or not on to what extent those uh, blinking uh, spots might uh, result in a greater 
uh, blindness or brightness. I would uh, elaborate that later on. But let me, uh, before I proceed to elaborate the, the three points, let me perhaps uh, say a few words uh, about the title. Um, and uh, of course, I should uh, begin by saying like, I'm not uh, selling cakes or baking cakes. <laughs> the title was chosen uh, for a reason that I'm going to uh, elaborate. But a few months ago, uh, when Ben uh, uh, first contacted me about this forum, his message was very, very clear, simple and so clear. He said that uh, he wants me to talk about, not so much about China, but he wants me to talk about responses to China. He wants me to talk about responses to US-China rivalry. So uh, that made my job much easier because there are so many things to uh, talk about. So I thought that um, um, I should focus on the term Middle States. You might be wondering, why Middle States? When we have uh, so many uh, leading experts on middle powers here, I think uh, Shiro and Alex and so many uh, uh, scholars are here on middle powers. So I do uh, think that uh, a quick answer and elaboration about whether middle states are the same with uh, middle powers is that they are related, but they are not quite exactly the same. Very briefly, I do want to uh, clarify that uh, middle states are those who are sandwiched between the two or more competing powers. But clearly, not all uh, middle states can be regarded as middle powers. Put simply, I would uh, define middle powers as middle states with three eyes. Middle states, middle powers are middle states with agency, three eye agency, initiative, institutionalization, and also uh, impact. Not every uh, middle states uh, can be regarded as a middle power in the sense that we know middle powers are those that does uh, have uh, agency. What sort of agency? <coughs> Initiative ideas are important. So meaning that if you are middle powers with agency, you are not simply uh, following the big powers idea. More often than not, sometimes whenever uh, it's necessary and possible, you put forward some initiative that uh, will be institutionalized together with some partners like minded countries. And being institutionalized is not good enough. You need to have some impacts that is going on. So that's uh, one quick clarification that I thought I need to make uh, before I fully, from now on, concentrate on middle states. We can come back to uh, the issue of uh, middle powers uh, maybe later on uh, during the Q&A. But uh, now uh, with uh, middle states, uh, and again, I want to uh, mention about a related term, which I will call as middle state mindset. Over the last uh, one year or so, uh, because of my job, uh, I do have uh, opportunities to travel around to uh, different countries in different uh, regions, from Singapore to uh, Seoul to uh, Santiago, and then uh, from uh, Bangkok to Bali, and also uh, to Budapest. There are many voices, different opinions, and different accents. <laughs> but I do uh, sense and heard something in common, which is what I call as middle state mindset. Middle state uh, mindset is in play if you or your country or your country uh, that you focus on demonstrate uh, the following signs. Number one, as I mentioned, you realize that you are aware of there are two or more competing powers. Secondly, you know that each of the competing powers wants something from you, either your support, your partnership, or your cooperation. You know that uh, they want you to do something and they do want you to do some other things. And the thirdly, Middle state the mindset means that you do know that how you respond to that big power competition, how you position yourself, to what extent, in what way you say yes and say no to each of the competing powers have consequential uh, impact. Why is that? Because you do know that because the big power gap, the vast power gap between you as a middle uh, state, either it's a secondary uh, state or smaller states, doesn't matter. The big power gap between you and the competing powers are vast. And that vast power asymmetry means that the two big powers 
in this case the US and China, can harm you and help you more than any other actors in the international systems. Regardless of uh, who are leaders in uh, both capitals, you do know that that power asymmetry and the concepts of that power asymmetry will not change. So that would uh, set the stage for, I think, our topic today. And uh, you do know that uh, when we talk about consequential uh, impact, you also uh, allow us uh, some space to talk about the main title today. You can't eat your cake and have it too. What does it mean uh, about that? We all know that it's about trade-off, right? And what is trade-off? In simple language, you get something, you lost something. There is no free lunch. There is a price to any decision you make. Either your decision is about alliance first policy or your decision is about alliance allergy. <laughs> you want some alignment, but you don't want to have complete alliance. Whatever your decision and whoever your partners, you know that there is a trade-off at play. When we talk about trade-off, the issue is not so much about whether or not uh, you know, there is a such thing called policy with trade-off or policy without trade-off. No such thing. Every policy, every decision, every move has trade-off. It's a matter of whether those trade-off is acceptable, less acceptable, or not acceptable. And ruling elites are the ones who decide based primarily, I say primarily, not exclusively, on the domestic conditions. With that, uh, let me very quickly uh, to uh, move on uh, to the first slide. I have uh, only three slides, and uh, um, the three slides are respectively uh, for the three main points that I mentioned. So I will have uh, blind, blind spots, and each of the slides, I will have uh, three points. Why three? Am I so obsessed with three? <laughs> It's for a practical reason. If anything more than three, I cannot remember. <laughs> if I can't remember, I guess that uh, my audience uh, can't remember, right? Especially at this hour. So I thought uh, I would have uh, three points to illustrate. What are the blind spots? What are the bright spots? And what are the blinking uh, spots uh, that uh, I have in mind? You might want to be wondering. When we talk about blind, bright, and blinking, uh, what exactly are we uh, referring to? I'm referring to... Uh, the emerging and growing scholarly uh, works and also policy-oriented studies about how best to make sense of the middle state alignment choices. And I do think that there are certain uh, areas that are blind spot. What do you mean by blind spot, right? Blind spot, uh, we do know that uh, it means that uh, we uh, fail to see something, uh, either because of uh, you know, how we position and then there are the certain uh, sites are being uh, obscure or blocked, right? But we also know that uh, blind spots uh, can happen, they can uh, occur when we overemphasize uh, on X, sometimes uh, it doesn't allow us to see a Y and Z. When you overzoom something, you overlook something else, blind spot. So uh, there are lots of uh, blind spots, but again, let me uh, just highlight three that I think are most important, that we keep uh, reading and also uh, coming across when uh, we start to uh, read uh, a lot of uh, materials and also either, uh, as I said, the academic works or uh, perhaps uh, also uh, policy-oriented uh, papers. So first thing first, I think uh, the first uh, type of uh, uh, blind spot is that all dangers are threats. I think we have uh, many uh, uh, in the audience, uh, myself included, many of us are students of IR, and we do know that uh, regardless of uh, where you study your IR, right, either in ANU or somewhere else in Malaysia, Southeast Asia, or even US or UK, threat is a, a recurring theme in almost all textbooks, and especially 101, right, IR 101. To a large extent, uh, I think it reflected the background of uh, how IR uh, is being developed, and we do know that Kenneth Ward's balance of power theory and uh, Stephen Ward's balance of threat theory are those uh, dominant school of thought that highlight threat in one way or another, primarily because of what happened uh, during a Cold War. And I would think that uh, both uh, Ward's and Ward, but especially uh, Ward because of his emphasis on threat, make us uh, realize that um, um, threat is a main uh, driver and uh, it's a human nature because of survival instinct 
whether regardless of your size, of course, uh, if you are smaller countries like Southeast Asia, your survival instinct uh, would be much bigger and profound, right? So we understand that. But just like any other good concept and good theory, they are being used widely, and sometimes I think they are being abused widely as well. They are so successful that I think uh, these days, there are interpretations or assumptions, implicit or otherwise, Anything that are dangerous or can be dangerous are described as threat. And I do think that this is a blind spot. This is a blind spot because of it doesn't allow us to uh, see the word danger or harmful uh, processes or entities can take many forms. Some are more pressing, profound than the others, right? So a threat, uh, I would uh, argue that, should be limited to those that are pressing, profound, here and now, clear and present dangers. If you do not do something to respond to those dangers, to those threats, your existential conditions will be affected in one way or another. Why is that important? Because of, uh, that will lead to uh, the second uh, blind spot. And uh, these are the things that you do know that uh, for IR scholars or even the common sense, you do know that uh, all these words that I underline here, threats, balancing, alliance, they all come together in the hardcore mainstream realist articulation. Either you talk about things in uh, Europe, in Asia or elsewhere. And they all uh, come together primarily because of the two blind spots that I'm uh, describing here. So uh, because of uh, the assumption, I would say an uh, inaccurate assumption that all dangers are threat, and uh, therefore, the solution is that you need to have an uh, alliance base or really the balancing to push back the threat. That was the essence of a uh, balance of threat, the theory, so on and so forth. So now, applying uh, those uh, concepts and also uh, theories to uh, what is going on in our region, right? Um, to pay respect to Helen, I think uh, I would now, for now, choose to use the word Asia-Pacific, <laughs> where Southeast Asia is uh, the center we realize that uh, you know, in uh, Southeast Asia today, or the larger Asia Pacific, you do know that uh, things are quite complicated. And there are many examples to illustrate that why not all uh, dangers uh, should be regarded as a threat. Let me just take, uh, uh, since Andrew is uh, 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 watching, uh, looking at me, and also uh, there are many experts on South China Sea. So let's take uh, South China Sea as an example to uh, indicate uh, why it is problematic analytically to uh, use the word threat to describe all things dangerous. And we all know that uh, it does uh, have a lot to do with China's action. China's growing uh, assertive and even aggressive actions over South China Sea, some say uh, since 2007, some say even earlier, have left the impression that this rising power is also a more threatening uh, power. This is like the starting point. And then uh, with what is going on, fast forward to 2024, you know uh, what is going on uh, over Philippines, for example. Clearly uh, indicates that there is a threat. Philippines uh, perceive uh, China as a threat. And the solution is to use alliance, US-Philippine alliance, as a way to execute balancing or really style a balancing. So meaning that you are not shy in describing calling uh, China as a threat. You are not hesitating uh, to uh, put more eggs, if not all eggs, in the US basket, basket in order to push back. That is realist, right? But wait a minute. Is uh, the same phenomenon uh, occurring in other Clement countries in South China Sea? Then you know that there are some variations, right? Vietnam did uh, something similar. I won't say exactly the same, similar, at the height of an uh, oil rig crisis in mid 2010s. That uh, certainly uh, indicates that, yes, danger or threat perception go up and down, largely, not completely, to what China is doing, to what extent it is doing. So that part was clear. But let's uh, expand the cases to Malaysia, to uh, Brunei, the other two, our uh, St. Clement country in South China Sea, or uh, since we have uh, many Indonesian friends here, let's uh, talk about Indonesia as well. Indonesia is not a climate country uh, in South China Sea, but we do know that because of uh, China's uh, nine dash lines and so forth, Indonesia somehow as a literal state of uh, South China Sea is involved in one way or another. So the question is, are Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei 
really calling China as a threat? You know that actually they do not. So there is a policy uh, difference in the concrete term. Are their actions uh, reflecting that they see China as enemy number one, threat number one? Again, the policy uh, evidence, what is really going on? If you think that the uh, statements, you cannot uh, use that as an indicator, let's judge from the actions, right? So since we're in Australia, and since we talk about Indonesia as an example, you do know that last week, there are two big things that uh, came out about Indonesia, right? On the one hand, I think uh, we knew that, and I think the Australian team is visiting uh, Indonesia today to finalize uh, the defense uh, agreement right, between Australia and uh, Indonesia. It's not new, it's uh, like a many layered and also a latest version. But uh, you do know that last week before that was announced, we also uh, read news. China and Indonesia are kicking uh, start the first two plus two mechanism. So what does it mean if uh, Indonesia really is seeing uh, China as a threat or enemy number one because of territorial problem? You will not have uh, seen uh, you know, that kind of like a two plus two with uh, Beijing. And two plus two is just one example. You do know that Indonesia under Jokowi is also, uh, has also been uh, one of the most enthusiastic partners when it comes to China's Belt and Road Initiative. Jakarta, Bandung, uh, simply uh, as in one example. Similar pattern uh, can be uh, talked about in uh, uh, Malaysia and also uh, uh, Brunei's case, right? And I forgot to mention uh, early on at the beginning that uh, we are also very glad to have uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Inche Azam Saleh, the counselor, uh, Minister Counselor of uh, Malaysian High Commission, uh, joining us. And uh, his presence uh, clearly uh, indicate that Whatever I say, only representing myself, right? <laughs> I'm not representing uh, any uh, uh, entities or institutions or any, uh, certainly not any uh, government, so I would speak uh, freely. Um, so uh, with that, I hope it's clear that why I say that uh, these two elements are the blind spots in um, um, the emerging literature on how best to describe and also explain why middle states in Southeast Asia and beyond align or react the way uh, they are doing, right? And uh, let me uh, carry on, uh, move on to uh, the next point related to, uh, you know, the kind of threat and also a balancing. The other blind spot that we keep uh, hearing, it's uh, the very either or black and white zero sum uh, assumptions, right? In uh, Southeast Asia, uh, I think with the intensifying US-China rivalry and also the involvement of uh, more next tier uh, powers, in Asia and also beyond, Southeast Asia, almost all uh, capitals uh, have been receiving so many visitors, uh, either from policy uh, practitioners or from think tank people and expert analysts and all that. So we have been uh, asked uh, you know, lots of questions, right? So sometimes uh, among the earliest questions, uh, kind of like beginning, um, conversation uh, beginner is that, is uh, you know, certain leader or certain policy pro-US or pro-China? I think Southeast Asian friends uh, will agree with me that uh, usually we smile, right? <laughs> Why should we uh, be pro-US or pro-China? We are not interested in a pro any uh, big power. We pro our own uh, national interest. Why is that? For survival. Paul, I think uh, early on, I uh, mentioned a lot about the uh, past, present, and also a future. Let me use the similar logic to explain why smaller countries in Southeast Asia are not interested in uh, this kind of either or. Either you are with US or you are with uh, China. We are not interested in any of this unless and until we have no choice because of emerging uh, threats, so on and so forth, that are straightforward. But uh, for the past, let's uh, not uh, forget that in fact the 10 ASEAN countries and uh, soon to be 11 now uh, when Timor Leste join, we are almost all, right, post colonial. Uh, countries. We are post-colonial states means that we are sensitive. We are victims of uh, centuries-long colonization. We are victims of uh, decades-long Cold War politics. I think we get enough uh, big power politics, although we do know that even if you are not interested in big power politics, big power politics are interested in you, right? And because of that, for present and future reason, you know that if you side with uh, any of the competing powers, you are inviting troubles. Why? Because when big power rivalry escalate into hot war or armed conflict, 
you do know that Southeast Asia will be the theater, will be uh, the place where the big power conflict, either a Cold War or Hot War, will uh, take place, and Southeast Asia countries will be the first to suffer. So for these past, present, and future reasons, we are not interested in siding with one over the other, right? Again, uh, all this uh, blind spot shows that uh, sometimes there are also a misunderstanding and also uh, misassumptions. Like for example, uh, treating Southeast Asia countries active neutrality, if uh, that's a, a better word, uh, than other alternative uh, terms. Some describe, you know, your active neutrality. It's only tentative. Or some would say that, Oh, actually, you're just waiting uh, for the right time in order to uh, join one power against the other, right? Let me tell you and let me provide uh, you uh, with a Southeast Asian perspective with a very strong Malaysian accent. That is simply big power bias. Big power bias, and I say big powers meaning uh, both US and China. Big powers for their own uh, DNA. Big powers DNA, historically and current form, they do many things, but one thing in common, the biggest one. Big power's DNA is to compete among themselves. For us, the current US-China rivalry is not new. It's only the latest uh, version of a big power conflict we learned that. So uh, our instinct, you don't have to attend uh, IR classes. <laughs> you do know that. <laughs> it makes no sense to side uh, with one uh, against the other, right? Almost every civilization would describe the situation when two elephants fight. <laughs> if you are not the elephant, you know uh, what will happen to you. you that's uh, part of the known unknown, right? So for all these reasons, uh, I think those are the blind spots. And those are actually, uh, I would say, an uh, analytical uh, trap. If your analysis uh, begins uh, from any of these uh, blind spots, I really uh, think that uh, it might not go uh, anywhere that might uh, help us uh, um, I know, uh, uh, understand uh, better why Southeast Asian countries are doing uh, what they are doing, right? Uh, when Indonesia announced that they have a two plus two, uh, I know my Australian friends are like wondering, what are you doing? No? <laughs> and you know, Indonesia is not alone, right? Indonesia is not alone. Many other countries, uh, including, I don't know whether uh, there are participants, uh, audience uh, from Vietnam, just uh, before we start, started uh, this session, I think uh, Helen and Ben, uh, we're talking about you know, which countries are kind of like navigating better than the others. I reflect, uh, I provide one perspective. I'm not saying that that is uh, the consensus among ASEAN countries, but some would say that Vietnam played the game very well. Where, what are the indicators? Last year, 2023, Hanoi uh, hosted the, pres the visit of the uh, President of the United States, and three months later, <laughs> President of China. Hanoi perhaps didn't have to invite or keep saying that we want you to visit, right? Big powers, the leaders of big powers uh, come. And what are they doing? They are doing something uh, quite similar to uh, what Indonesia has been doing, right? On the one hand, on the one hand, upgrading a defense partnership with former enemy, Uncle Sam, right? Defense Corporation. Who would have thought the US aircraft career would enter into uh, Vietnam, but not for war? for defense partnership. And the like-minded countries as well are going to uh, Vietnam in one way or another. But are these balancing? You might ask, really start balancing? You do know that it is not. Why is that so? If that's what Vietnam is doing, strengthening alignment even without alliance with the US and like-minded countries, without doing something else, that would be balancing. But we do know that at the time when Vietnam, regardless of who are the leaders, who are in charge in Hanoi, they are doing also the opposite processes and actions, right? They are using party-to-party -party links. Communist uh, leaders in Vietnam are using party-to-party -party, uh, links to send a clear signal to uh, China that even I'm uh, strengthening my defense partnership alignment with the other side, <laughs> I'm not uh, using that to uh, go against you, right? And then uh, if uh, actions are not good enough, 2019 Defense White Paper of uh, Vietnam make it very clear that it's uh, repeating, re-emphasizing re the tr Vietnam's three no policy and make it four no, but also one depends. The underlying message was very clear from Vietnam, again, regardless of uh, who are the leaders, right? 
So Vietnam is trying to uh, tell uh, China, to signal to China that I'm not departing from my non-alignment, no uh, foreign basis uh, policy and all that. But if your actions are threatening me directly, profoundly, I will have to uh, make some adjustment. So that gives us some space for everybody to navigate, right? I think China get the message so far, right? Otherwise, would I have uh, seen uh, more occurrence of an uh, oil rig uh, uh, crisis, no? The last uh, oil rig, it was uh, really quite a number of uh, years ago. So in a way, you can say that uh, um, the, the kind of like uh, active neutrality, some would say uh, hedging, yeah? uh, clearly uh, at play, and so far are bringing some uh, stabilization. Of course, nothing is guaranteed, right? I think there are so many uh, Mr. Uh, Heijing and also Madam Heijing here in the audience. So uh, they know that these days I try uh, to talk about Heijing without using the word Heijing, right? <laughs> because I do know that Heijing might uh, spark some other debates that are clearly uh, not within the purpose that the Ben and also uh, Helen have uh, told me. So I, I'm trying to be a good boy here. We have uh, many other uh, you know, examples that um, uh, we can uh, elaborate. But let me uh, just very quickly uh, uh, kind of elaborate one of uh, kind of favorite words that, sorry, Helen, I will have to use the uh, Indo-Pacific from now on. Some of the key words that uh, um, you can use the word Indo-Pacific powers, right? So meaning that uh, Quad powers, right? US, Japan, Australia, India. When uh, Quad was uh, revived in 2017, the next few years, we don't let uh, each of them in turn, are launching the Indo-Pacific document, right? And it did not uh, stop. The, it did not stop at the uh, Quad uh, uh, countries, Quad powers. You also s begin to see uh, European uh, countries, right? Uh, European countries, uh, one by one, I think uh, it was France, and then uh, Germany, Netherlands, and then EU as a group, right? Are launching their own uh, Indo-Pacific. And then uh, you also know uh, UK have something similar. The latest uh, one who join uh, uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, dynamics uh, were Canada and also uh, South Korea, right? They launched their own uh, Indo-Pacific documents uh, in uh, late 2022. So all these uh, uh, tentatively for the purpose of this discussion, let's call them as uh, Indo-Pacific powers, even though we know that ASEAN countries, as a response to what is going on, also are uh, compelled to launch, again, uh, under the leadership of Indonesia, the big brother in Southeast Asia, launched the ASEAN version of uh, Indo-Pacific, right? AOIP, right? ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific. What is so different between ASEAN version and the Quad or Indo-Pacific powers version? There are lots of similarities, emphasis uh, on, you know, the rules base in one way or another, the principle of, uh, you know, uh, safe and also a free uh, navigation, transparency, equality, but more importantly, there are some distinctions in terms of what are the norms or principles that are being emphasized more by ASEAN countries than the other powers. That is about inclusivity. Inclusivity is core because ASEAN understand, ASEAN countries understand that. Inclusivity is the way to go however things evolve. The more things are uncertain, the more you need to be inclusive, meaning that we are not going to do anything that will exclude any power that would send wrong message and that would increase the uncertainty and also a larger risk. But the term that I want to, to emphasize really is about the like-minded, right? So the Indo-Pacific narrative, there are a number of words that are being emphasized and used so often, right? So rules-based order is clearly uh, one of them in the Indo-Pacific uh, narrative or the part of Indo-Pacific powers. And then the other one is uh, like-minded and then uh, also uh, about decoupling and then rephrase as de-risking because of European uh, countries' concern. But let's uh, put others aside. Let me uh, talk about like-minded and then uh, later on, I think we can move on to the second and also the third uh, slide. Yeah. Like-minded. This is a term uh, that is quite straightforward. For those transatlantic US uh, partners, allies in Europe, and also I would say Northeast Asia, and certainly uh, Australia. Everybody use it. Leaders, officials, analysts use like-minded almost all the time when Indo-Pacific uh, is being uh, phrased, right, or used. Everybody use it, but nobody define it. At least not the uh, official uh, circle, right? So Southeast Asia, we are 
kind of sensitive. <laughs> we always uh, interpret words, right? What do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? So uh, we try to interpret. What do you mean by light-mindedness, right? So since nobody, at least not the uh, official level, uh, define light-minded in the Indo-Pacific narrative context, our observations, but again, when I say oh, our observation, meaning that uh, those uh, the track to or academic or uh, think tank uh, our observers are interpreting like-minded in this uh, Indo-Pacific context can have three meanings, right? Always three. Number one, like-minded means politically you are liberal democracies. Second, strategically you have the guts of standing up against China, speak out against China. Third, economically, you are willing, ready to uh, collaborate on decoupling and de-risking. So now, you might ask, uh, what are the reactions of uh, Southeast Asia? Uh, that's an uh, inconvenient uh, truth, right? Let's take uh, again uh, in Vietnam as an example, and then uh, let's uh, add one more country, Singapore. Vietnam and Singapore are like-minded nations on strategic aspect, right? So are these two countries? Whenever it's necessary, they do uh, stand up, speak out on something that would defy uh, China's uh, some stance or core interest, right? Singapore, for example, 2016, when Philippines under Duterte uh, decided uh, to put aside the arbitration, right? Singapore was the one uh, who kept emphasizing international laws and so forth. So there was a selective and partial uh, defiance. They knew China is not happy. They did it nonetheless for their own uh, calculation, for their own uh, interest. A smaller country, vulnerable about all these uh, issues. So uh, they uh, do that. Vietnam too, right? I know uh, oil rig and then a uh, pushback. Those are uh, always uh, continue. Vietnam, whenever necessary, they will defy uh, China one way or another. Again, uh, if we uh, go beyond the high politics uh, domain, not just the maritime and military and defense security domains, on, non, on the low politics of domains, on economic development and technology, 5G is one example, right? Out of the 10 or, so, or 11 uh, Southeast Asian countries, which are the countries that exclude Huawei from the 5G uh, rollout? Singapore and Vietnam, right? They, uh, although they do uh, allow Chinese uh, tech companies to operate within the uh, high-tech uh, domains, but on 5G, they think that the trade-off is simply too high, too risky, because of their own uh, calculation. But interestingly, when the two uh, governments, two countries, Vietnam and Singapore, uh, declare that they are excluding, they are not including uh, Huawei in their 5G, they did uh, emphasize that this is our own decisions, nothing to do uh, with US. <laughs> or any uh, other uh, countries, right? So they want to uh, do the right trade-off, but within, uh, you know, the still a positive uh, signal, right? So here, why I talk about Vietnam and uh, Singapore is that, as I said, strategically, I think uh, you can see that these two countries, unlike many other countries, who are a bit polite, <laughs> maybe low profile, try not to uh, openly uh, criticize China on many issues, right? Even uh, Xinjiang, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, government uh, don't openly criticize uh, Xinjiang. We uh, defer rather than defy China on some issues. And let me emphasize that those deference and defiance are only selective and partial, right? Selective and partial. You might be wondering, right? Uh, what do we mean by deference and defiance? We would go into that uh, min a minute later. But here again, back to uh, Vietnam and Singapore, the reason we are using uh, these two uh, countries as example to say is to show that the like-minded notion is not so straightforward beyond US allies in Europe and also Asia. Why is that? Southeast Asia, these are the two countries, Vietnam and Indonesia, who are strategically quite like-minded, although not all the time. But hey, when Biden administration uh, hosted three rounds of summit of democracies, were these two countries invited? You know the answer, right? So, uh, and every time uh, when U.S. Uh, emphasize about democracies versus autocracies, <laughs> these are reminder, right, that uh, telling the government authorities in Singapore and Vietnam that you are not quite like-minded <laughs> when it comes to a uh, polit political uh, aspect, right? And then decoupling, I think uh, almost every country are getting a bit uncomfortable, even though some countries are benefited. Some countries in Southeast Asia are benefited uh, by the intensifying uh, US-China 
competition, including uh, U.S.-China trade. And in fact, uh, we also benefited in one way or another uh, by the uh, China plus one uh, strategy. But however, we do know that all those benefits can be temporary and it's beyond uh, your control, beyond your preference. You want that to continue, right? But again, you know that it is not up to you. That in a way is tragedy of a smaller state, right? I know uh, realists uh, talk about like John Mearsheimer, the classic work, tragedy of uh, big power politics, but I think smaller countries, we have a greater uh, tragedy uh, in one way or another. And by saying that I'm not uh, pessimistic, don't get me wrong. And in fact, many countries in Southeast Asia, Malaysia included, sometimes uh, describe and use the word uh, small state to describe uh, you know, how uh, we are our position within international system, right? The use of the uh, word small state by Southeast Asian countries in one way or another are being uh, misunderstood that uh, we are passive, we are reactive, or we accept uh, all those uh, hard realities. Actually, that is a misunderstanding. All these smaller countries are using uh, the word small state or weaker countries as a self-reminder, precisely because structurally we will always be weaker, smaller, and more vulnerable. We need to uh, have more agency, need to have uh, prudent uh, choices than many others, right? So with that, I think we are ready uh, to talk about the second uh, point, which is about the bright spots, right? So there are blind, there are some uh, bright aspects. Uh, whether or not uh, these uh, bright aspects uh, will last, but I do think that if uh, you put uh, uh, lots of attention and closer look to contemporary emerging uh, literature, either in Asia or elsewhere, you do uh, think that there are some trends that are going on reflected uh, in the literature. So I have uh, three points. Here is about three I, right? I like uh, the word I clearly, the alphabet I. Uh, but there are not exactly the same I as uh, we mentioned earlier on when we talk about middle powers. But the first I here as uh, the first uh, bright spot, it's I do think that uh, the literature, the scholarly works are getting more and more interdisciplinary. They are going uh, beyond uh, the traditional uh, IR uh, disciplinary uh, boundary. What are the examples, right? There are a lot of examples, but I do think that uh, let's take uh, psychology, sociology, and also uh, economics uh, as an example. So those uh, there are certain uh, words and terms uh, that are not quite like a typical IR uh, uh, terminologies, right? So, uh, but there are kind of like uh, import <laughs> from uh, other disciplines. And there are more and more scholars who are working on these uh, middle uh, state alignment choices, who are applying uh, this uh, in one way or another. Psychology, uh, for example, uh, instinct, fear, and emotions is uh, getting uh, more and more attention in one way or another. Some are about middle state alignment choice, some are about foreign policy behavior beyond uh, alignment choice, but you do uh, see uh, lots of uh, emphasis and also uh, usage and application. For example, the issue of whether or not hedging is a strategy, right? So it's uh, one of the debates uh, within the hedging literature. No? Why is that? Some say that, uh, well, in Southeast Asia, for example, some would say that perhaps only Vietnam and Singapore have strategy. Indonesia, kadangkala, right? <laughs> Depending on uh, the conditions. Other countries, uh, you do know that it's more problematic if strategy means that something very coherent clearly uh, calculated and uh, there is some consistency in one way or another. But you do know that hedging might not be a strategy, but you do know that the hedging is a human instinct. Human instinct is a human uh, reaction to what is going on. Under high stakes, high uncertainty uh, conditions, human beings, rational actors in one way or another, will uh, do something that can be called as a hedging, so on and so forth. Let me uh, stop there and then uh, move on to uh, other uh, disciplines. Sociology, I think, has uh, always have a big, big impact on IR. Social constructivist, uh, of course, uh, is one indicator. But uh, let's uh, put aside social constructivist. Even on the research on alignment choices, you do know that uh, over the last, I would say, 10 years or so, there are a number of uh, typical sociological terms being applied to international relations. I would think the logic is uh, understandable because uh, some would say that interstate relations are extension of interpersonal social uh, relations, right? You don't have to be a social constructivist uh, to uh, have uh, some agreement, some extent of agreement. So again, there are lots of examples. Let me just uh, highlight three here. It's about risk and riskification, right? 
So risk and risk creation are in a way are correspond to uh, the earlier blind spot that we talked about, right? Not everything are about threat. Some which are not, uh, some dangers which are not pressing or profound, they are not so much about threat, but there are risks, right? Risk meaning what? They are potential. They are possible. There are some possibility that it might happen or it might not happen. But human being or creature, we are sensitive to uh, the perceived risk. We would respond uh, in one way or another, but risk is not one, right? But the long list of uh, risk, we might come back to that. And then riskification simply means that we are all uh, seeing some risk, but uh, some risks are being played up or sometimes being played down, right? So for, for example, uh, when China uh, Coast Guard uh, appear in some countries, uh, maritime uh, uh, sphere, space, some kind of governments will play down. Let's not report about that. Let's not overreact. You do send uh, your Navy assets or Coast Guard to shadow, but without overreacting, right? You play down. Some say that the current uh, Philippine uh, policy is a bit of uh, playing up for a number of uh, reasons. Some are structural, some are domestic, but we can get back to that. Now, so now let's uh, talk about defiance and also uh, um, defiance and deference. Again, uh, all these like uh, academic terms or sociological uh, terms, let's uh, use uh, um, the lay layperson's uh, uh, usage. How can we uh, make sense of defiance and deference? It's a sociological term, it's a social behavior, and I would say that when this uh, happens uh, in almost all human relations, deference simply means saying yes, showing respect to either uh, bigger power, more important uh, person, how you treat your boss, right? <laughs> Whether you realize it or not, there are lots of uh, differences, no? human behavior. Defiance is the opposite, right? It's about saying no and showing autonomy. I might be small, I might be weak, I might be vulnerable. On some issues, I am my own boss. You might put pressure on me, I will say no. So those are sociological terms. But look at uh, what is going on in Southeast Asia, how countries in Southeast Asia respond to both China and also the uh, United States, right? There are lots of concurrent application of defiance and also deference. Any example? There are, I think, lots of uh, examples. Um, since we have already uh, used uh, uh, example of uh, Indonesia, let's uh, again uh, um, use uh, um, maybe uh, Vietnam, right? So uh, since it is the master of aging these days. So Vietnam uh, practiced uh, defiance and deference towards China and United States at the same time. And they make sure that both uh, have to be applied at the same time. Why is that? If you only do uh, deferences, you might mitigate the risk of big power hostility but they will open uh, up the risk of getting more subservient and also dependent. Trade-off. But if you keep also uh, using defiance, keep saying no to China, keep saying no to certain power, that would uh, help you to mitigate the risk of getting subservient or secondary, right? Or satellite the state, but it increased the risk of big power confrontation. So in order to uh, preserve some space and strike a balance across all these uh, trade-offs, countries, smaller countries, make sure that they will do both at the same time. Not uh, all the time, but at the same time, and partially and selectively. Therefore, Vietnam, know that uh, China is not happy about Vietnam increasing defense partnership with the uh, US and many other powers. China, Vietnam would insist uh, to do that partial uh, defiance. But in order to send a good uh, signal to uh, China, and uh, Vietnam would make sure that it would show uh, some differences either to party to party, so on and so forth. One recent example uh, would be uh, uh, last year again, we knew that uh, Vietnam had a double upgrade of uh, US relationship, right? Uh, Vietnam-US relationship is now comprehensive, comprehensive strategic partnership. At the same time, this is being offset by China, Vietnam also agreed to the Chinese uh, vision of shared future. 
a departure or adjustment from the earlier uh, reluctance. Early on, when uh, Xi Jinping's uh, China had been promoting uh, about that vision of a community of a shared future, Vietnam uh, defined, keep distance, right? But eventually, it was uh, adjusted. When Vietnam tries to uh, show deference to the US by upgrading into a comprehensive strategic partnership, this effort is being offset by the opposite uh, situation of also showing some deference to China. I know uh, you wanted this a lot. Let me uh, say yes. Uh, the judgment is that that is acceptable trade-off, right? So now uh, let's uh, move on to, uh, I think, uh, economic uh, uh, discipline. Of course, uh, there are lots of uh, um, kind of uh, economic disciplinary insights have been applied to uh, IR, including uh, alignment uh, uh, choice, like cost-benefit trade-off, and think. Uh, which is the focus of uh, today's uh, discussion. But you are seeing the first uh, bright spot in the sense that there are growing uh, cross-disciplinary uh, insights brought into uh, the study, the research of uh, alignment choices. I think more to come. Uh, related to that would be uh, the second uh, uh, bright spot, what I would call as an uh, interlevel analysis. Right? This is, uh, I think, uh, a trend that has been going on for quite some time because I think one of the criticisms about the... Uh, hardcore, old-school, uh, realist interpretation about alignment choices is that neorealist uh, analysis uh, doesn't make complete sense, right? When neorealists only uh, focus on one level, factors at one level, structural level, for example, then uh, today, I think it's getting a, a kind of a, a growing uh, trend in the, in the sense that while analysts still uh, um, kind of acknowledge the importance of uh, structural factors, like the uncertainty uh, between a big power action and reaction, they also emphasize that there are factors at other levels at work. For example, domestic, right? And domestic can be legitimation, domestic uh, can be regime type, and uh, even uh, leadership, so on and so forth. Different analysts will uh, choose a different domestic variable, but the trend, I'm not saying like uh, every uh, analyst, but growing number of uh, analysts, you could see that their analysis is a combination of more than one level, right? And it's not just at the uh, structural and domestic uh, level. You also see uh, in part because of uh, IPE uh, research, right? And uh, IPE research and uh, other related uh, studies uh, allow us to see there are growing interlevel analyses that focus on domestic level and subnational level. The economic uh, actors, special interests, provincial, state, local level are at play. So we can uh, uh, go on to uh, highlight uh, and give uh, more examples, but perhaps at uh, the time might not uh, allow us to do that. But so let me uh, just uh, say that, that the second bright spot is about interlevel analysis at multiple levels, and those factors are being used uh, as uh, reasons or motivating and also uh, constraining uh, factors. The third bright spot, I think, is about additional material uh, factors. Again, typical neorealist or old school are really uh, focused primarily on material, about military power, about defense uh, interests, about uh, you know, the uh, high politics uh, 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 interests and issues. But more and more, there are those that, uh, while acknowledging uh, the relevance of material uh, interests, military uh, power, relative power, and also uh, economic uh, interest, they are also emphasizing uh, those that are intangible, right? The uh, ideas, ideologies, identities matters. For example, nationalism as a source of uh, factors uh, in influencing why, for example, Vietnam and perhaps the uh, Philippines, in that, for that matter, are more ready to uh, adopt a more confrontational uh, um, kind of approach uh, towards uh, China on the South China Sea. So we can um, kind of uh, get back to this perhaps uh, during the Q&A. So now with the time that I have, let me move on to the third and also uh, the final slide uh, for um, uh, today's uh, discussion, the purpose, blinking uh, spots, right? So blinking. So uh, meaning there are still like, ongoing. And uh, we are not know, we do not know, at least uh, at right, now, right now we are not quite sure whether these blinking uh, <coughs> spots or kind of uh, trends and elements will result uh, into a brighter <laughs> spots uh, in the analysis of alignment choices or perhaps I uh, would uh, repeat what we already uh, highlighted as a uh, blind spot. But I think the first uh, blinking spot uh, with uh, what is going on um, uh, that we, we discussed uh, over the last uh, uh, 
maybe 50 minutes, is that trade-off uh, is uh, uh, being highlighted in one way or another as one aspect that we need to pay attention. Uh, why countries, middle, middle states, uh, pursue the kind of policy uh, the way they do. And uh, trade-off, uh, meaning that uh, you can say it's about how you calculate and with uh, costs and benefits. But clearly, trade-off uh, is more than just about the uh, cost-benefit uh, analysis. And there are a number of uh, dimensions of uh, trade-off, right? Sectoral, spatial, and also uh, temporal. So sectoral would be uh, whether economic benefits should uh, be traded uh, over security uh, uh, calculation, or is another way around. Economic security nexus literature highlight a lot about the uh, sectoral trade-off. The spatial will be internal consideration, external consideration. Should we uh, emphasize uh, more about internal authority over uh, external um, um, uh, uh, space? That would be a, uh, a decision that to be made by uh, different uh, countries. Temporal will be long-term and short-term. Again, those are the kind of uh, main directions that are moving. I'm not saying like we already are seeing some concrete uh, results or breakthrough. I don't think uh, that is uh, happening right now, but there are more and more efforts that are paying uh, more attention along the line. So now, the second uh, blinking uh, spot, um, so here we are having a 3T, right? Trade-off, threshold, and also uh, we are going to have the third T. So the thin line uh, threshold in the sense that a lot of uh, alignment choices, either uh, because of as a reaction uh, to big power politics and big power policy, has a lot to do uh, with uh, there is a thin line between uh, the processes. Uh, we can uh, use a lot of examples, but let me just uh, focus on uh, one of the contentious uh, issues in the current policy circle and also uh, uh, IR analysis, whether or not we are already in Cold War 2.0. I do not think there is a consensus. There are competing and different uh, interpretations uh, as to are we already in Cold War 2.0. The word 2.0, of course, uh, do not just, uh, does not just refer to the time uh, frame, right? During uh, what was uh, going on between US and Soviet, and then now uh, with uh, US and China. Certainly time frame, that's one, but people, analysts are paying more attention about the uh, defining characteristics, right? Some would say that uh, Cold War, meaning that it's a short of uh, uh, hot war, um, at least uh, not directly, they might be a uh, true proxy and all that. But to cut the long story short, my argument is that Cold War 2.0, if it is happening, will not happen overnight. Cold War 2.0 is a process. We are at some point in that process. If I can unpack uh, Cold War 2.0, I would think that uh, there will be uh, three stages. I think we are in uh, stage one. There are more elements, we are moving into stage two, but stage three would be somehow very dangerous for many of these uh, middle states, but certainly Southeast Asia. So which are stage one, two, and three? Stage one is what we are already uh, seeing, right? The economic technological bifurcation. As big powers, the competing powers, in this case, US and China are competing, not just militarily, but also non-militarily, economic, 5G, high-tech, cyber, digital, and uh, you know, the uh, supply chain, so and so forth, is a clear example. As we talk, many things are happening. Chip for Alliance uh, is a one uh, indicator of that. So I think economic technological bifurcation is already uh, happening. And we are all aware of that. Some are more nervous than the other, depending on uh, who you are. Netherlands uh, already is uh, inside that uh, process economic and technological uh, bifurcation. So now, I think there are growing signs that this economic technological bifurcation is uh, slowly evolving, not completely yet, but there are more and more signs into what can be called as geopolitical bifurcation. Because uh, bifurcation might not necessarily stop at the economic and technological uh, aspects. It might spill over to are you with me or are you against me, right? So when that happened, going beyond economy and technology, then you are seeing the dual strategic bifurcation, which will lead to the third one, which is uh, what we call as not just bifurcation, but polarization. Polarization, in my view, meaning you are one side and there are another side. That is the most defining, uh, important defining uh, attribute of Cold War 1.0. 
you know where you are, right? But during Cold War 1.0, the basis was ideology. Today, I don't think ideology uh, is that, uh, you know, the most important uh, one. I do not know uh, whether, what would that be? Or uh, how soon? Or whether or not we can uh, kind of uh, uh, avoid stuck perhaps in uh, stage one and two without going into polarization, which is the reason uh, why many countries are getting nervous, right? Even Singapore, uh, caution uh, against the so-called French shoring and also near shoring. Because uh, if that really happened, you are resulting uh, into you know, two different systems. And again, as I said, bifurcation might not necessarily stop in economic and technology. It would spill over to uh, other aspects of uh, the political, geopolitical aspect, and eventually might result in regional polarization. That whether you like it or not, you can announce you are neutral, actively neutral, but you might uh, find that you're already uh, in that uh, kind of dangerous zone. Uh, I, let me uh, move on very quickly to the last point. So threshold uh, will uh, result into uh, the third T, right? Trajectories, right? Trajectory, I think, uh, is very, very important. And small countries, including those, or especially those in Southeast Asia, middle uh, states in Southeast Asia, are very nervous because of the survival uh, instinct uh, that we have. We are seeing, like, uh, because of the thin line uh, threshold that we are witnessing in uh, one domain over the other, we are seeing a lot of uh, alignment choices indicates uh, some direction, different uh, direction of the trajectory. It can be for more dangerous or less dangerous. But we do know that there are a lot of uh, uh, kind of um, um, signs, growing signs. For example, as a big power uh, continue to uh, compete, there is a, a kind of a organizing logic of deterrence, right? And again, a deterrence, uh, it's uh, not just really a theoretical uh, uh, a term. We do know that it is organizing one of the key principles um, uh, that underpin big power strategy and also a competition. Smaller countries are ambivalent about deterrence. We do understand deterrence is important. Smaller countries, whether or not we are climate countries or not, we do want some balance of power to constrain China's behavior so that China would not become too uh, assertive and aggressive. But we understand that there is a thin line between constraint and containment, and it is uh, not up to us. The very emergence of uh, Quad, and then uh, there are talks about Quad Plus, and then uh, there are AUKUS, and then you, are talk you uh, hear news about NATO in Asia. Early on, it was just uh, talking about the Lysen office in Tokyo, right? One or two persons, a few persons. But uh, with the recent uh, summit uh, of uh, NATO, you do uh, know that there are new developments in the sense that IP4 is being uh, talked about, right? So IP4 are uh, in two Pacific uh, four, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and South Korea. None of these are NATO members, but the way it's being uh, projected is like Asian uh, NATO, right? So you're seeing uh, not just a continuity of uh, US uh, hub and spoke systems. You are seeing uh, all the basis of what has been going on over the last 70 years. You are seeing some new trends where more spokes, US uh, allies and partners, are being tied together, anchoring on US hub and are uh, doing a lot of deterrence. So as I said, from Southeast Asia's perspective, we might have a different interpretation. Philippines, I think, will welcome that uh, more than others. But other countries generally are very nervous in the sense that we, as I said, ambivalent in the sense that we want some constraining effects, but we are worried those certainly uh, will have the action uh, reaction processes. Earlier on uh, this morning, I think the first session, uh, um, 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 Dr. Kennedy and then uh, Professor Huang and also Professor Chao talk about big power action reaction between the uh, US and China, right? Again, I think smaller countries in Southeast Asia, we don't have to uh, attend uh, lectures or uh, classes to know that action reaction is something that beyond anyone's control in Southeast Asia. But when action reaction reach certain stage trajectory, it would affect us and it would affect us negatively and adversely, which is one of the reasons why Indonesia and Malaysia express concern about AUKUS. 
We expressed concern about AUKUS. Some would say that it's uh, about the nuclear issue, nuclear dimension. But more importantly, my interpretation is that the two countries, other countries share the concern, but I think uh, they have a different way of uh, articulating their concern. But Indonesia and Malaysia are concerned about the action reaction of that process. My US friends, Indo-Pacific uh, powers will uh, say that when you say action reaction because of uh, AUKUS, are you blaming us? But China started first, right? We understand, South East Asia understand. And in fact, we are not quite interested in going into that debate because why? That kind of conversation is like uh, when you quarrel with your siblings, right? Who started first, right? <laughs> it's action reaction. Yeah, you can say that uh, China started when uh, it became more aggressive, asset, assertive uh, over uh, South China Sea, and then there are lots of action. But we are, we, the South East Asia, smaller countries, middle states, we are less interested in really like identifying who started first. We are more worried, but well, that's beyond us. We are more worried about the consequences of that action reaction process. Why? We are not busybody. We are worried about the consequences because we do know that action reaction, deterrence, deterrence that would not, uh, deterrence meaning that you keep uh, adding uh, the deterrence impact, right? You would uh, keep building up your armament and also an alliance, and the alliance will be uh, the stronger, the better, the more uh, states, the better. That are the things that uh, worry smaller countries because the other side, meaning in this case, uh, China, would not uh, do nothing. They would uh, expedite what they have already uh, have in mind. So some observers, some observers uh, in New Zealand, in Australia, and also other places are saying, uh, are telling me that it was not a coincidence that uh, China have uh, the deal with uh, Solomon, right? And uh, increase the presence in the uh, South Pacific as a response to uh, what they seen as growing encirclement or containment, right? And uh, again, uh, some would use the example in uh, Cambodia, right? Again, China has been doing that, but I think you could see that the pace and also the scope are getting uh, more and more. And as I said, we are not interested in like uh, talking about uh, who are to be blamed and all that, we are more, we are more concerned about the consequences because why? If uh, we are just pursuing a deterrence and uh, also a limited the deterrence, I think uh, one thing is quite clear. We are going to uh, move into either Cold War 2.0, as I described earlier on, regional polarization, or hot war in one way or another. What are the potential uh, hotspots uh, that might turn into hot war? We know that is South China Sea. We know that is Taiwan. My friends in Latin America, in Middle East, even uh, I would say other parts outside of Southeast Asia, you are blessed with geography. Southeast Asia, we are under that geographical scope because of the proximity. And even uh, if you declare neutral, as uh, military assets uh, move northwards from Australia, Philippines is already an threat. I think countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, whatever you declare, certain things might not uh, happen uh, within your preference. It would be a greater uh, uncertainty in one way or another. So I think smaller countries are uh, knowing that, the danger of that uh, limitless uh, deterrence. And therefore, while we are also collaborating with uh, some uh, version of deterrence, we insist to uh, do deference and, def deference and also defiance selectively uh, at the same time. It's uh, because that would increase the space uh, for peace Nothing is guaranteed. Smaller countries are not naive. There is uh, no uh, guaranteed uh, policy options, right? But at least it would uh, provide uh, some space uh, for countries to uh, act and react. And uh, eventually, I think the final point uh, here is that, uh, again, uh, since we started by talking about agency, let's uh, end uh, you know, the discussion on, uh, mid on uh, agency as well. So uh, middle state uh, agency, uh, it's uh, what I think countries, many countries in Southeast Asia would insist uh, to pursue, knowing that uh, the space to do that is uh, shrinking. We all know that. Nothing will last forever. But precisely because of uh, the trade-off for alternative uh, policy, other than active neutrality, would be uh, more unacceptable. Countries will hold on to uh, the current agency in inclusive, selective, and prudent way for as long as possible. So with that, uh, let me end my presentation, and uh, I will look forward to your questions, criticism, or disagreement. Thank you very much. Thank you.